Welcome to the EW Podcast. I'm your host, Eric White. In today's episode, I speak with the father of one of my best friends. His name is Patrick Kilbride, or PK. Uh, PK is a friend I made through his daughter, the aforementioned friend, and also through the Whole Brain Power program and Michael Lavery. We talk briefly about the program here, but if you'd like to learn more about Whole Brain Power, you can find uh, the link for my interview with its founder, Michael Lavery, in the show notes for this episode. Patrick Kilbride was a successful sales executive in the hotel industry for 30 years. He moved from Florida to California and finally Hawaii, where he opened the Grand Wailea Resort. He also worked for Hyatt Hotels and Ritz Carlton and was highly trained in customer service. Today, Patrick is an avid volunteer, particularly for children, and he currently serves many nonprofit organizations on Maui, including Kiwanis Club, Maui Food Bank, the Homeless Resource Center, Waipuna Chapel, Backpack Buddies, and Kids Hope. In this episode, we talk about PK's at times rough childhood, which is detailed in the book Kick Her Again, She's Irish by Mary and Colin O'Reilly. We talk about the struggles he faced growing up, the role humor has played in his life, how he managed to overcome the residual effects of his childhood later in life, and the things for which he is grateful, among other topics. This was a very fun conversation for me to have, and I hope that it can be a source of inspiration for you as we end the year, or whenever you happen to listen to this. Before we get into it, a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, First, I will be taking a break from this space until the second week of January. I have four interviews already recorded to be released next year, and at the moment, two more scheduled for January. So I'm going to take several weeks off and enjoy the holidays with loved ones and also read a bunch of Star Wars books. Around January 11th, I'll be back. And as mentioned before, I will start releasing these episodes with video of the interview on YouTube. If you'd like to subscribe to that, I've included the YouTube link in the show description and I encourage you to check it out. Also, if you haven't signed up for the monthly EW podcast newsletter yet, please consider it. I'm having a ton of fun putting these emails together and hope that it is providing some value to those who have already been receiving them. In the newsletters, I've been providing uh, updates about new things from the EW podcast and the blog space that I sometimes post to. I've also been putting in some links to things that I've found useful across the internet, and these could be apps, things that I'm reading, things that I'm listening to or watching. And I've also been giving subscribers um, a space to make suggestions or submit questions. So if you have something you'd like to suggest for the podcast, whether it's a guest, a topic, something I could be doing better, or you just want to say, hey, thanks you can do so through the newsletter. And as mentioned, you can occasionally submit questions for upcoming guests. This is something I hope to do a better job of next year, Um, but it really helps if there's more subscribers. So if that sounds like something you would enjoy, visit the show notes for this episode and find the link to sign up for the newsletter. So I think that's all that I wanted to cover in this. If you're listening to this episode with Patrick Kilbride before the new year, I hope you have a happy one and I will see you in 2021, so to speak. All right, without further ado, here is my conversation with Patrick Kilbride. All right, so I'm here with Patrick Kilbride. Thank you for joining me, PK, as you like to be called. Yes, sir. Thank you. Do you mind if I call you that for this interview, PK? I, I like it. It's um, a badge of honor for me. Thank you. <laughs> um, so before we get going um, into kind of your life story and its significant points and why, why we're here talking about it, I just want to give a little background um, about our relationship and um, how we ended up here. Um, so you are the father of one of my good friends out here in California, um, Katie Kilbride. Well, Katie Hackett now. Katie uh, Hackett. That's Katie right. Katie Hackett. 
Um, and I met you through her and we eventually started communicating somewhat frequently, not you know, probably once a month or so, I would say about for a little bit of time there about uh, whole brain power. Uh, yes, which, that's correct. Which was a memory training program that uh, I was put onto by Michael Lavery, a former guest of the show. Um, and since then, we've kept in loose contact. And this was a podcast we had planned to do some time ago. And then coronavirus happened. And that kind of threw a wrench into our plans. So I'm happy that we were able to make this happen. I think the focus of our conversation is going to be slightly different than it would have been um, seven months ago. But here we are. Well, thank you for being patient. And uh, I'm looking forward to the privilege of, of this uh, opportunity. Yeah, I'm really, really excited to speak with you. I know... Um, you've had an interesting life and, um, you know, as someone who has gone through a depression and some suicidal moments, close suicidal moments, um, I definitely can relate to some of the things that you're going to share with us here today. And another just point of interest is that there is a book written about your childhood, right? That's right. Uh, a, a younger brother and his wife. Uh, patiently, probably might be 10, 15 years. I'm not sure how old this book is. They took the time to interview quite a few family members. And then with those stories that were copied um, by opportunity of recording them, they turned all those recordings into a book. And the book is called Kicker Again. She's Irish. And basically, my mom always thought, It'd be wonderful to have a book written about her story and about her life and also um, her life involved all of her children. And quite a large family it was, right? Yes. For, for us, um, I thought uh, six siblings. I have four brothers and two sisters, an older sister, a younger sister, and then three older brothers and a young brother, younger brother. And we're um, uh, divided up in a big way. So the first three siblings um, were all by themselves and they were born in Massachusetts. And then uh, Michael shows up uh, five years after um, Ellen. And then um, Patrick shows up five years after Michael was born. And then Jeannie shows up a year later. And then Jimmy shows up a year later. So there was um, almost three separate um, living arrangements for each of us. Hmm. By the time we were old enough to know and remember our, our siblings in the early, uh, late 1950s, they've already gone off to the Navy. Uh, hmm. Gary went to the Navy, Michael uh, went to the Navy, Chip went to the Navy. And um, I probably thought, you know, at some point, I guess I'm going to go to the Navy, but <laughs> that, that didn't work out for me. <laughs> Was that ever uh, on your trajectory at all, besides thinking that it might be likely? Well, um, what happened, yes, uh, I, I was uh, in a school setting in California. Um, I was being tortured because I wasn't really good a, as a student. And I decided I was going to quit um, and join the Navy. So <laughs> I went to the uh, recruiting center. This is in San Rafael, California. Um, this really uh, eerie looking building. Um, I get there. This is in uh, some month of 1967, I'm 17, I'm old enough to join. I go to, into the recruiting center office and it's completely empty. There's not a soul there. And then I said, all right, I'll just, I'll wait. I'll, I'll try to fill out the application. Um, my handwriting is horrible. Uh, my spelling is horrible. My reading is horrible. Um, so I realized I can't fill this thing out. So I waited a little bit longer, I think maybe somebody had helped me. And so in my mind, I was um, being protected. And I left the recruiting center and I said, okay, go back to school. And I, you know, didn't leave. I didn't uh, quit. And that was uh, somewhere around late 10th grade or 11th grade. So, yes, I, I was seriously thinking of it for a quick moment, but um, 
it faded because uh, nobody was there. Nobody was there to, to help you. Yes, yes. And then the lottery system showed up. Uh, President Nixon started that lottery system. And I had a higher number than the number that they were going to stop at when it comes to um, drafting soldiers. So they went to 125, and I was uh, 170-something. So I knew uh, in high school that I wasn't going to have to go to uh, war. And um, that was a relief. And um, we watched our friends coming back that were coming back alive, mentally um, abused and tortured and had lots of problems. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, some of them, uh, we went to their funerals. And uh, that was a pretty sad moment for all of us. Yeah. Um, and then um, high school, I graduated finally and um, went to the uh, British Virgin Islands to uh, help with my dad's uh, scuba diving business and did that for a little bit. So you managed to escape the war and the terrors that are being in a war, but you had your own struggles growing up. Um, yes, yes. I'd say my, my, my war years were uh, the first uh, 15 years of my life. And it was just because of uh, a divorced family and the drama and that that causes and, and watching the separation and the fighting and the bickering that causes a lot of drama and, and, and pains and, and wounds. Um, but, um, you, you also have that the environment, you know, children need to have an environment where they're, um, eating well, they're not frightened. Um, they feel protected and that learning ability of mine was not, whatever the problem was, um, the combination of uh, being in a broken home, uh, being hungry, having to uh, steal your food for um, the family dinners, uh, that was not a, a good learning environment mm. for me. That's interesting. Um, reading the book, Kicker Again, She's Irish, you definitely get that sense of kind of a home that might not be nurturing the children very much, but there is also some playful aspects to it. Um, sometimes that, you know, some laughs are had still amongst those oh, pages. Yes. And yes. I think that's like one of the things that I maybe know you most for is your prankster-ish. You're, you're very, you're a merry prankster, if you will. <laughs> I, I am. I am. It's a, it's a, a form of therapy. So how, how, where, where did that, like, how was that able to manifest itself whenever everything else was so um, difficult growing up? Well, uh, it was, I think it's the Irish blood. It, it's the Irish personalities. For example, my mom, here she is, um, her husband's left her and uh, we're um, on a public bus heading somewhere. I'm not sure where we we're going. And one of our little chicks she would pull on us. I loved it. Uh, she'd, she'd go, Jimmy, pull my finger. And then, you know, Jimmy would follow orders and then she'd fart. And then she'd go, Jimmy, don't you dare fart. This is a public transportation. And, you know, that, that sense of humor, um, we, I think we got from my mom. And, and there were plenty of um, you know, other examples out there where even though uh, it felt, uh, you know, like we were Never going to make it. We did, and uh, we kept our sense of humor. So, and then there's uh, another one that my uncle Miley, you know, talk about family. We we had the O'Connor family, and there were thirteen of them. So, <laughs> um, thirteen O'Connors and seven Kilbrides hanging around the same neighborhood, and we had lots and lots of uh, fun parties. So, we'd had this thing. I don't know if we ever told you this story, but it was the Blarney Stone. So. Um, let's say Patrick's got a new girlfriend and he says, you know what? I'm going to bring her over to the house, the O'Connor house, and I'm going to set it up so that she gets to kiss the Blarney stone. And then we'll see whether or not she's really um, meant for me. And each one of us, all the siblings, you know, the O'Connor side and the Kilbert side, that's how we would test our future boyfriend um, or girlfriend. And so here's how it would work. Someone, 
someone would say, Uncle Miley, can we have Mary um, kiss the Blarney Stone, our family heirloom? And he'd say, oh, yeah. And so everyone knew what they were supposed to do. Everybody had their own responsibility. So we'd do a little circle, and everybody's sitting around, and someone's pretending like they're going to go up to the attic and get this big box. And in the box, there's this beautiful jewel that's a piece of the Blarney Stone from Ireland. Mm. And then we would blindfold the victim, literally a victim, and we'd sit him down in the chair. Um, and what we would do is we'd get the sibling, whoever was had the biggest butt, <laughs> and they would stand on a chair next to the victim with the blindfold. And then we'd have someone with a fatty uh, arm, and we would have that victim. Okay, here we go. We're going to have you kiss the baloney stone. And so they'd kiss the inside fatty part of someone's arm. And then at the same time that we would whip off the blindfold, the gentleman or the lady would pull up her pants. So <laughs> it looked as if you just kissed one of the butt of the Kilbride O'Connor clan. And some of them would literally run out the door screaming and never come back. <laughs> so that's our humor. That was the test. That was the test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just want you to know, Jimmy's wife, who's been his wife for all this time, and my wife, who's been my wife for 34 years, they did not run. Wow. They hung in there. Yeah. That's interesting. So, yes, yes. Piece of Kilbride family history right there. Yes, yes. But you know what? Because of how traumatic it really was, we've actually um, banned it from ever happening again. We, the, <laughs> the third generation, we said, nope. So whenever they would try it, we would warn the potential future spouse. Um, this is what they're really trying to do to you. So we, we've nixed that as a uh, family tradition. <laughs> it's probably for the best. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Someone are, could probably get arrested. Yeah. yeah, times are a little different, I suppose. Um, but I, I mean, amongst these kind of merry, joking um scenarios in your childhood there was also a lot of pain right I, I'm, I think I remember in the book um, a particularly um, wrenching scene of your mother being arrested and um, being hit by a cop is that right well it was um, actually uh, the, the whole story I don't know if it was there in that book but uh, the, the she actually sacrificed herself hmm. so what happened was my brother Michael got in a car accident, and the police were looking for him because the way the accident looked like, it looked like it was a hit and run. They assumed that my brother hit a bunch of these uh, people that are lying in the street. And what really happened was the car has uh, four or five of his friends, and they were taking turns driving in a rainy evening. And when it was Michael's turn, he hit a tree, and the tree busted um, the car up so bad that it threw everybody out. And the ones that were actually there, um, you know, was, was, was there with the police. But Michael got away. And they assumed that Michael was the driver and he had this hit and run thing. So now they're looking for him. Mm -hmm. So my mom knew in advance that she had to set up an opportunity for the courts to say to Michael, you either go into the Navy for six years uh, for four years, or going to prison for six. So here's what my mom did. She said, and this is what she, she, she'd get really mad and uh, start screaming and yelling, and, and the neighbors would, would say, oh, my gosh, she's at it again. And then the paddy wagon and a handful of cops, um, and my mom sets it up so that she's in the street. Now she's trying to run as fast as she can into the back of the house to get in. And that's where we... Um, at six, seven, eight years old, somewhere in there, the three of us, Jimmy, Jeannie, and myself, uh, watched the cops grab her, start dragging her, and then my mom, to make sure that they beat the shit out of her, um, started punching them and cussing at them, and she had um, a nice long cuss word that could go forever and ever, <laughs> and she would kick them, and uh, so they literally, when, when we had opportunity to see her the next day, uh, black and blue from head to toe, so those pictures, that experience, 
when we had the two court cases come up, my mom made that deal and said, look, I won't press charges mm. if you let my son go into the service rather than prison. So talk about a mother bear taking care of a cub, right? Yeah, for she, sure. She did that. So she um, did that a few times. Um, and uh, we, we also drove her crazy uh, quite a few times. And um, we um, thought that when she would go to the insane asylum, there was a Miami uh, uh, insane asylum down the street from where we lived, a couple of blocks away and she'd be asked to you know come there and stay there um we would ask her to stay there and if 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 i had um known that in my mind she was just going there for a two-week vacation because um she was in heaven she was happy she was reading she was uh, having people visit her that were crazy um and then when we'd come visit her she'd say all right i need some quarters and i need some cigarettes because uh Mary likes to steal from me and Johnny likes to steal my cigarettes. So <laughs> she would have these people. Um, and then all of a sudden uh, she'd say, okay, vacation's over. And she'd walk out of the hospital and then they would call and we'd listen to my older sister saying, so you're, you're telling me you don't know where my mother is and you want us to find her for you. Wow. <laughs> you know, one of those things. Yeah. My mom's sitting right there. And I said, well, I'm not going to bring her back. If you want her, you come and get her. And they wouldn't come and get her. Um, so that, that's, in my mind, she would take her little vacations, staycation now, you know, think about it, little staycation at the sanitarium. But they did do some mean, horrible things. The, the uh, shock treatment was a big thing back then. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was an alcoholic. Um, she um, was very sad. Um, she did not ever forgive my father for leaving a family of, of seven uh, to be on their own. And um, I think that's what eventually, uh, sometimes those, those feelings can cause illness. And she also was a smoker, but she mm -hmm. uh, died of lung cancer uh, at 53 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I was 19 when um, I left California and came back um, to uh, be part of that, that funeral. And to just kind of give some context, you were born and raised in Miami, moved to California, and then came back, correct? Yes, yeah, born and raised uh, until I was 15. And my mom said to my older brother, Chip, who had left earlier, and he was in the Navy, and he'd left, and he went to Berkeley. He was going to Berkeley, California as a math major. And he came home to, you know, say hi to all of his siblings and mom. And my mom begged him to take um, me and my younger brother back to uh, California with him because we were in a situation where my mom knew that I was going to be either uh, killed by the police or sent to prison by the police. So um, I was um, a delinquent and um, one of the... <laughs> fun things at 12 years old, you know, you, you get to be the man of the house. <laughs> so, cause you know, you, you, your older brother who's five years old, he, he got to go into the Navy because uh, he was forced to. Um, so I'm the man of the house at 12 and my mom was fed up. She calls the uh, <clears throat> police department and says, I, I can't control my son anymore. Can you please uh, come get him and put him in youth hall? And they said, Sorry, Mrs. Gilbride, we're completely full. You have to take care of them yourself. And her, her line, I'll never forget, was, um, all right, listen, I'm tired of this. I tell you to come home at nine. You never come home at nine. Whatever you do out there, don't get caught. So mm. that was my pep talk from my mom. And from 14, 15, 16, um, you know, I, I made sure that I never got caught doing any of the stuff that I was not supposed to do. Hmm. So just want to kind of paint the, some, um, some, some of this picture in a little bit for people who are listening. Um, yes, sir. So we've kind of gone into how you were, uh, a, a, 
a delinquent as a child and liked to break the rules. Um, but you also had some difficulties in school. Um, I think in your words, you say you were illiterate. Yes. Um, so how, how did these, how did you overcome these struggles? Like you are a very, you know, fun person to talk to, very uh, jovial. Um, these things seem like they would be major setbacks for a person. How, how have they impacted your life? And, you know, what, what, what does that arc look like? All right. Well, what's, what's fun about this is everyone has a particular handicap, right? Mm -hmm. And in my case, my handicap, if, if you want to call it a handicap, is, is invisible. So someone that has a leg mangled up or an arm or a face, but all, all I you know, had a problem with is I could not read the written words. And, and the way I described when I was in first, second, third grade was the word C, I'm sorry, the letter C, the letter A, and the letter T for cat were mm -hmm. oceans apart. So you can imagine just trying to get that one word, and then I could never understand why I couldn't see the next word. So when you're standing up in front of a classroom and the children are making fun of you, so that trauma, you know, those, those, those repeated traumas, because I don't know why the teachers would constantly take turns uh, and ask people to stand up and read. And when it came my turn, I was hoping that the children there would just look straight ahead, don't smirk, don't smile, don't laugh, and let me be tortured as I try to read, um, you know, four or five sentences. And my, my eyes would be watering, my throat would be, you know, hurting, because that's what happens when you're feeling sorry for yourself, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and um, over time, I realized that because of the gift of gab, if I remembered stuff, if I could tell a story, I didn't have to learn how to read. Hmm. So I was in a hotel business for 30 years and never had to read anything because I would study it. So if I was going to learn and, and work at a beautiful hotel, I would understand the product. I would understand the destination. I'd practice and practice. And then I'd go all over the country talking about these beautiful resorts and asking decision makers and corporations all over America to come to... Miami Beach to come to um, the Hyatt um, uh, Del Monte, and and I would ask them to come to Maui. I had uh, the Grand Wailea, so all of that skill set, I would practice, study, um, practice, study, and then I could stand up and do a full-on presentation for um, you know as long as needed, and answer questions because I already knew what it is that I was going to share and what was important as far as information. So. That skill set was invisible. And then as I was entering, you know, the, the hotel industry, it was beautiful because the secretaries would um, let you dictate. So I could talk mm. and tell and use the words. I just couldn't spell them um, or read them. So I could dictate a great letter. And then, of course, the secretary would make sure that it was perfect and um, that's, um, just one of the ways I was able to hide that. And then you, you kind of learn what not to do. And, and you learn not to be a leader of any major organization because then that will require you to read stuff. But if you're just uh, a supporter, a helper, a doer, um, and then you always pick something that no one else wants to do so that they'll leave you alone. And then your, your line is, I'll get it done. Don't talk to me. Don't ask me. I'll report, and that's what I was able to do my entire hotel career. And one of the general managers had this huge table, and all the executives would be at this table. And this particular general manager liked to give um, an opportunity for one of our guests letters that we receive and have somebody read it. So I learned that if I'm at the opposite end of his seat, there's no way that he's going to hand that to me to read out loud. So um, I was able to read um, to the uh, level to, you know, become a successful hotel person um, because of my brother Chip. When I, again, left Florida and we literally for, for two years, he would 
read the, the book, Tom Sawyer is just one of the examples. He'd read the book out loud. I'm using my finger as he's saying those words. I'm going down the page and I was able to remember what it is that I heard. And then for the first time I was elated. I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? You know what I was able to do? I was able to participate in a class discussion about the book, Tom Sawyer. Oh, that's great. Because of that help. So over time, um, I was able to uh, get to the point where I'm you know, at a 12th grade reading level. And, um, but, for 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 reading quietly but for reading out loud i wasn't comfortable doing that until i was in my 50s yeah well i mean it sounds like you had developed some pretty um nifty avoidance techniques to just kind of shield yourself and not put yourself in a position where you would you know be quote unquote exposed or whatever but yes i'm yeah. sure that all kind of got turned on its head um, when your daughter Katie was born and a certain level of expectation that you will as you know read read to them or, or share that uh, that ability with them in some way was that was that difficult for you well uh, it was actually horrifying you know I I was I was frightened because I was gonna have to read out loud all those children's books and I was in panic mode um and she's she's just she's not ready to read she's not ready to listen and here i'm thinking <laughs> ahead i'm gonna have to learn how to read these books so i started practicing um but um you know reading to your daughter um and she can't correct you right mm -hmm. so it, it wasn't uh, that difficult but uh still having those trigger moments of uh being six and having the uh, children laugh at you because you're looking stupid up there yeah. uh, that still comes back to me even today i i uh, am a sunday school teacher and god has a nice way of having a sense of humor so here <laughs> i am at six seven and eight being tortured because i can't read and now i'm reading um stories from the bible to six seven and eight year olds who don't read yet oh, man. so yeah i mean Give me a break. Is that you've cool been, or what? Yeah, you've been <laughs> been put back in the classroom. Yes, yes. So right, the teacher. Yeah. But here's what happens. I can't believe it. One of the, you know, two or three different classes, there's a really smart child that's, um, you know, the son or daughter of a pastor, and they'll correct me. And literally, I don't mm. know why, but that trigger comes back, and here I am, six years old again, and all of a sudden, I'm freezing. Mm. And I'm going, oh, man, snap out. So I... I snap out of it faster um, than, um, you know, the real life situation. But f f for me, literally reading out loud to adults, um, the moment was in my uh, men's group uh, at my Puna Chapel here in, in Kula. The leader of this men's group gives you a little piece of paper that's got a verse on it. And you're supposed to find that verse. And then when it's your turn to read it, you're supposed to be able to read it. And I'm going, oh, God, really? <laughs> oh, God. So I'm in panic mode. I'm panic mode. So my entire, you know, up to this, even now, I, I, I cheat. And I go ahead and I make sure <laughs> I'm reading that. I got it. I got it. I got it. And everybody else is around me reading their thing. Right? Wow. I go, How much time do I have? And then um, it was almost as if... Um, you know, the scales of a fish, it was mm -hmm. almost as if the scales, uh, whatever was on my eyes, they fell off and I could actually read the word that was next to the word that I was reading. And then I, I said, oh my gosh, I can read, I can see the next two. So somehow, um, I believe God said, okay, sorry about that. I, I had to protect you so you wouldn't get, you know, killed in the war. Um, mm -hmm. But now you can read and all of a sudden, I'm now reading very well um, out loud, and I can actually see the X two, three words out. So wow. I'm blessed for that. But now um, it's uh, still, uh, those triggers still happen. And I, I yeah. still have to, you know, say, hey, wait a minute. So that trauma, um, I, I'm sure there's some initials for whatever that is, or someone that goes to war and they come back and they have these little issues when they hear a uh, a loud pop, they mm -hmm. jump and dive and 
So I do the same thing uh, emotionally. Yeah. Just your nervous system responding to um, uh, stimuli from the environment that it has already learned to be afraid of or to yes. per- perceive as uh, a fight or flight type of scenario, right? Yes, yes, that's exactly it. And when I was, um, again, growing up because of the environment, if someone tapped me on the shoulder, the appropriate response was to turn quick and punch them. <laughs> so in the hotel business, um, I had to learn that that tapping on the shoulder was not the appropriate response. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll get you. That'll, you'll oh, be finding right. a new job pretty quick with that that's one. Right, that's <laughs> right. But it was, you know, there's things, that's just one of the examples uh, of how you can grow out of those uh, uh, scenarios. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I guess one of the questions I have about this whole thing is um, just what kind of uh, doubt or shame in yourself this created? Because I know, you know, from my own personal experience, things from my childhood or in my life that I maybe didn't live up to my own expectations for or um, created shame for me at some moment when I was younger um, could kind of all add up to make me feel as though I'm not worth things that I have today. Um, and it makes it, it can make it difficult to, you know, with my partner, with my girlfriend, Lauren, um, one of the problems that we had early on and still occasionally in my, you know, worst moments, it might come up is just feeling as though I don't deserve to be loved for, you know, various things. Is that something you've dealt with? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. My uh, entire life, I, I would, literally um, have to prove it. So some of the relationships that I had growing up because I didn't feel worthy to be loved and that, uh, that abandonment I think has something to do with it when you're abandoned by your father um, and then the trusting of the world, um, that becomes an issue. So you don't trust and you don't think you uh, deserve to be loved and then you have someone in your life that's trying to love you and support you and then you make sure that that person is proven wrong Mm. because you do everything in your power to destroy that relationship. I've I've done that quite a few times. Um, Linda, although, uh, was able to be strong enough and said, nope, I'm drawing this uh, this line in the sand and either you stand up and and be the man that you can be or I'm out of here. And um, Linda and I have been married for 34 years now and uh, I'm blessed that she's one of my angels that mm. came into my life. And then Miss Katie um, has shown me that I can actually be um, one of the best fathers in the whole wide world. So I've been uh, blessed to have uh, a daughter and uh, a beautiful wife um, for the last 30 plus years. Would you attribute attribute your ability, your your journey of getting over those um, doubts in yourself to your relationship with Linda? I know that you're also a religious person, so I'm just wondering how all those things uh, might come together and in what ratios. Sure. Well, well, Linda's um, family and and her love for me and her love that they had, you know, have her family. Uh, the Morgan family, they uh, actually uh, slowly but surely being in that environment, um, I began to enjoy Christmas. I hate Christmas. I hated Christmas. But Mm -hmm. Linda uh, and their family actually uh, made me enjoy Christmas again. And I'm one of the biggest, uh, you know, Christmas giver people in (laughs) in Maui County. And and I've been giving uh, my time and my energy uh, for quite a while now, but um, that, uh, that environment that I was in because um, Linda was strong enough to put up with some of those hurts and there, you know, I sound like I'm mad, but I'm not mad. What it really is, is, is I, I'm hurt. Mm. She, she poked at something that, that hurt. And so I slash out and it's, it's not me being mad. It's me expressing my, my, uh, my hurt. So uh, at uh, 12, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, there were always moments where um, you, you think it's not worth it. I'm going to give up. Um, and uh, somewhere in the teenage world ages, I contemplated suicide and 
Um, there were moments where um, I would have an angel step in and say, no, nope, no, nope, that's not the way to do this. Keep going, keep mm -hmm. going. And then um, my uh, relationship with God is I uh, trust him. I didn't trust him when I was younger because of what happened to my mom and how um, my dad uh, decided to relate to us as his children. But um, very comfortable now with uh, my relationship with uh, Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and I, we get along great. And I know exactly <laughs> when I'm not doing what I should be doing. And he's um, very quick to say, you know what, let's, let's uh, leave that right where it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you for asking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's interesting the religion part of it, um, you know, I am personally not religious. I did go, I was religious when I was younger. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm starting to realize is the benefits that um, believing in a higher power, something bigger than yourself, what, what kind of benefits that can have. And, you know, I'll just be straight up with you. I, I am atheistic in my beliefs, in my personal beliefs. Um, I respect people's uh, right to worship, right to religion. And I, I am totally fine with that. And I have been starting to think that maybe some of the problems that are going on in our world of just like all the pain have something to do with people becoming less religious, less, you know, there's a lot of things that religion provides other than just stories, you know, it's community, it's uh, faith. Those are all things that I think are important in life, regardless of if you believe in um, a, a God and all, the, all this other stuff. Well, I, uh, I understand where you're coming from. I, I was that person. And um, it, it's just to let you know, it's, it's, it's an invitation. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, here I was, you know, I'm up here in Kula, and there's this church, Waipuna, and I've been driving by it for, you know, three or four years now. I uh, would look at it, wouldn't want to go in. And then here I am providing a service for um, new hotel sales and marketing people. Mm -hmm. I was in the hotel business, and then I became a marketing um, person for my own company that I owned with a business partner and I. And then we would introduce ourselves to the new sales guy representing the Grand Wailea. He would make sure that he or she would know more about Maui other than just their property. So we would take them on um, excursions uh, in our cars, uh, and we would take them up to um, you know, different beaches, and we went up to the top of Haleakala, the crater that's 10,000 feet, and I had a, um, a tour guide that would learn and, and teach uh, all the things about the uh, – uh, the rocks and the plants and um, this gentleman, um, Michael, decided to have a conversation with me about um, his faith and his church. And I said, well, you know, that church that you're talking about, Mike, um, I drive by it uh, a lot, but I, I just don't feel as if uh, I'm capable of walking in there by myself. And he said, well, look, why don't you accept my invitation? Come in with me and we'll sit down in the back. And by the way, that's where I sit in the back of the room. <laughs> I'm more comfortable right there in the back of the room. Um, so um, I did that, and it felt really, really nice. And then uh, um, they had these little announcements, and one of the announcements was we're doing uh, baptisms, and if anybody's interested, if you're being called, if you're being invited, if you feel the invitation. So I accepted that on October 13th, 1952, there are, or, or, I'm sorry, uh, October 13th, 2002. <laughs> I, I became 52 years old that year. Okay. So in my mind, my sense of humor, God said, okay, you got all 52 cards. <laughs> accepted my invitation. Um, you're being baptized in the name of my son. Um, welcome to the family. So that's um, how I describe how I became um, a believer and a follower. Yeah. And, um it's uh, it's it's uh, a nice nice way to do it, and I'm real comfortable with it. And I and I do believe I am being given opportunities to um, overcome all that that pain, and um, using the skills that I thought I was never going to be able to use, which is reading, and um, 
I, I think, uh, again, God's sense of humor is, is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I love that your initiation into the church kind of coincided with the time that you started to become more comfortable to read. Is that right? That's, that's Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, see, reading was it's all. What happens is for me when I'm reading the book, I can read the book. If I see the word, if I if I'm really curious, I have the dictionary. I'll look it up. You know, mm-hmm. now you could just use your phone and look it up. Um, but um, it's the pronouncing. It's the, mm-hmm. the syllables. So now you have this phone that actually you know sound out the word for you, sound out the the the, the phonics of it. So I'm uh, having a blast with that, and um, I am. Um, having fun with um, what Michael has taught us regarding the alphabet mm-hmm. and uh, doing the alphabet backwards. Uh, Michael Raverty, he's uh, the gentleman that's talking about uh, the, uh, the mind and how you can actually make that mind do what you want it to do. So I got my alphabet backwards all squared away and um, I'm having a blast with that and I hope to do more and then uh, continue my sessions with him uh, um, in a couple of months. That's awesome. Yeah. Are, are you, what, what level of impact does, uh, I know you mentioned before that sometimes still you freeze up whenever you're reading out loud to the kids, if someone, um, maybe corrects you and your mispronunciation, is there any other like impacts in your life that, uh, are still lingering from, from your experience as a child? Um, well, um, I, I know I, I don't I don't like um, scary movies. I don't <laughs> like I don't like sad movies. I only like happy movies. Um, I don't like bullies. Um, to this day, I hate bullies. Now, when I was younger, I would just you know pretend that uh, a bully. It was terrible. I was like one of these um, the Venus flytraps. You know the the plant that uh-huh. um, is up there and his mouth is open, and then this fly comes by and he grabs them and eats them. So I would do the same to a bully. I would um, set myself up so I looked vulnerable in school. And I went to three different high schools, right? So I had plenty of opportunities to be the new kid in the block, new kid at school. And then the alpha dog decides, oh, let's uh, welcome him appropriately. <laughs> and I would set myself up to look like, oh, no, oh, no, Mr. Bill. And then when they <laughs> didn't expect it, literally sucker punched him, kicked him, knocked him down to make sure they didn't get up. And for me, in the environment that I was in growing up, there's only three choices. You run, you talk your way out of it, or you hit first and make sure that the person doesn't get up. So, yes, I still have those little jerky moments where, oh, my gosh. But on the other side, because the Lord is with me, I'm saying, you know what? Let's forgive that person right away. So... The forgiving part um, is is a, a lot easier on your uh, system. Yeah. What what advice might you have then for someone like me who does feel as though you know I'm still still getting over things from my past, and you know I want to live to be your age and older and uh, be a happy individual throughout my life. Increasingly happy, I think, is a good goal. What, yes. what, kind of, what kind of tips or um, pointers from your own experience might you just bestow upon me? Yeah, I would say uh, reaching out to um, your community and, and find something that you think would uh, help some scenario. So I grew up hungry and I help um, children um, with uh, delivering of food to them, to their school. Hmm. Um, the... Um, uh, bocce ball tournament that I do next year will be the 10th annual. And we raise 30, 25 to $30,000 a year for the Maui food bank. Um, so giving back to your community is, is a big, big deal. Um, and then um, sharing the grace, just, just realize that you don't know where that person is coming from. Mm. You don't know what happened to him when he was a child. So, um, I open doors. I uh, always let people, um, you know, go into the traffic lane before me. Um, everything I, I, I try to treat myself. Believe that I am a 
hotel person, the Rich Carlton hotel person um, in the entire community. So it's hmm. yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, let me get that door. Um, may I help you and, and be a doer. When you see an opportunity, what, what happens is um, you and I, and a lot of other folks, they see a problem and they go, oh, I hope somebody um, takes care of that person. I hope somebody takes care of that young man. I, I hope somebody will. So rather than hoping, why don't I be that person? Hmm. So it doesn't take um, any extra effort and be ready for that opportunity that presents itself. Um, and you go, oh, hey, that's me. I, I can do that. Hmm. I'm the guy that can be the one that's going to help them. Now, I can't fix somebody's tire. If somebody's <laughs> pulled over, I, I know immediately you do not want me there. I am not the tire guy. You know, my, my car experience is I am um, now so cool. I just push the button. I don't yeah. even need my key. And then um, I, uh, the, you know, when I was not as uh, in the situation I'm in right now, a $10,000 car, um, you have a choice. You can go get it repaired and have it be, you know, 1200 1500 bucks, or you can trade it in right then and get another car <laughs> and your monthly payment is, was 150 now it's 160 So now you've got another brand new car and you haven't had to pay one bill for repairs. That, that's me. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, um, so I did that about three or four times in a row. And then one, <laughs> one car that I had was so bad. And this is Linda, um, you know, dating me at the time. And I would, when I would go to a restaurant, I'd always set it up where um, the valet guys, I'd say, do me a favor. It's, you're going to like this more than me. Park my car so that it's on a downhill slope. This is in California. Because uh, it'll, 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 you need a running start to get the engine going. <laughs> <laughs> That's so amazing. one time he didn't listen to me and we had to get the, uh, you know, truck guy, tower. Um, and here is Linda and I in the, you know, in the c cab with the guy that's towing my car um, back home because the guy didn't listen to me. He didn't get a tip either. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. And in that same car, one of my uh, Rich Carlton executives come in from Atlanta and he's, uh, you know, watching the hotel being built uh, on the bluff of uh, Laguna Niguel. So he says, hey, can I borrow somebody's car? And I say, yeah, you can borrow mine. So he gets into my car and it's this long, you know, it's like a boat. And when you turn the wheel, it's like a boat. So you have to turn it a long time before you get it to turn. <laughs> so he's there and it's, there's no air conditioning. He comes back, he's dripping wet. And he says to the general manager, um, Bill, uh, do me a favor, get this man a new car or fire him. <laughs> so, so I got a brand new car. I mean, yeah, a brand new car. And a, and a bank account kind of a thing going. And my general manager said, uh, well, um, here you go. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, I, I'm not a car guy. And then we have this beautiful home. And um, I can do things with my hands um, out in the yard. But the house stuff, you have to have, um, we call um, our, um, our handyman, his first name is Sam. And Sam can do that. Sam can do that. Now I'll help him. I'm his mm -hmm. little helper. Um, <laughs> and then um, because of uh, being retired, I get to go around and, and help uh, my, my best customers are the 70 year, 70 year old plus ladies that don't want to weed anymore. I don't like the gym. So if you hire me, I'll work out in your yard. I get what I want. You get what you want. So I, I think that's just a dream come true um, relationship. So yeah. <laughs> I got quite a few of those out there and um, Linda thinks it's a kick and I'm sharing my, my um, it's so cool. This one name, let's see, her name is Judy. So Judy and I are writing emails back and forth using numbers for the letters. Like a code? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, A is one. Oh, right, and right. 26 is Z. Mm -hmm. So you write your little notes. And then she writes back and, you know, you know, so I'm getting really good at that as well. Um, That's awesome. But I, but I feel um, that um, life is just going to get better. Be, being in the 70 something, um, you know, decade uh, club is, is going to be pretty cool for me. That's awesome. That's great. I, 
I just want to double back and kind of highlight something you said that I thought was really interesting about um, how you grew up hungry and now, you know, work to raise money for the food bank, um, delivering meals, or was it, it was delivering meals, right? For kids? Yes. Delivering yeah. uh, meals and food. And Yeah. Um, that's just super interesting to me because I had a lady on the podcast named Barbara Aerosmith Young, and she's come up with a program um, for people who have learning difficulties of very varying degrees, varying forms. Um, and the thing that she does to help them get over their learning difficulties is comes up with exercises that target the part of the brain that is lacking or causing the difficulty. So it's kind of like you're, you're addressing the deficiency of something by doing that thing. Right. And that's kind of like what you're doing, but it's like almost on an emotional level, which is cool. So it's, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's a cool thing. I just wanted to highlight. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, it's, it's, you, you don't want to have children um, being in an environment where they're hungry. How do you expect them to learn? Mm-hmm. You don't want the environment to be um, uh, in a frenzy or um, violent. How do you expect them to learn? So mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of organizations that are, um, they actually take the children out of the house of an abusive home. And uh, there's a big, big group of people that uh, love helping children that way. Um, I, I'd like to think that all of the things that happened to me, I'm now able to um, say to, um, you know, this, this community at some point, I'd like to be able to, um, I think the big win would be, here I am teaching someone how to read. Now, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. That'd be great. This this hour has flown by. Has it been that long already? Yeah, we're coming up on um, 54 minutes here on my recording. So I just wonder if there's anything we missed that you would like to touch base, touch on, or um, do you feel we pretty much covered everything? Is there anything? Yeah, I think I'd just like to be um, a a grateful, grateful moment. So the teachers that helped me, um, I certainly am grateful for them uh, that pushed me along. I remember being in uh, eighth grade, you know, going into ninth grade and uh, the principal and and my um, homeroom teacher said, Patrick, guess what? Great news. You don't have to take any exams. Don't have to take any tests because you are graduating. <laughs> <laughs> you are graduating. I said, great. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So um, I appreciate the teachers that would let me. My last um, you know, period of class in, in, in Miami, Edison, I'd have to jump over the fence so that I wouldn't get beat up by a group of boys uh, that thought I should have given them my lunch money. So um, I appreciate those um, you know, teachers very well. I certainly appreciate my dad um, when I tried to quit school in ninth grade or 12th grade because I was afraid I was going to have to stand up in front of the class and the girlfriend that I was dating was going to find out that I am stupid and can't read. Hmm. And I decided I was going to quit. So I went to the British Virgin Islands and visited my dad on his island unannounced. And he said, no way, I'm not going to let you quit. You're not a quitter. You go work for my friend, you know, his name was Bunny. Go work for my friend Bunny. You're not coming here. <laughs> so I go to work for Bunny, and this is kind of a cool thing. Bunny is working at a hotel in St. Thomas, and he's in the construction business. So he says, yeah, I'll give you a, a job. So what am I doing? I'm on top of the Blackbeard Hotel, um, and I'm laying down the tar with a mop, a hot tar with a mop. And I said to myself, really, am I that? afraid of standing in front of my class and reading a book for my book report. And I said, no. So I made 76 bucks in two weeks. I flew back to Miami. I asked the teachers and principal to take me back. They took me back. I studied, I practiced. I got an A and the teacher said, all you have to do is try. But what happens is you're so afraid that you're afraid to even try because you, 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 you're afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. So if anything, Anyone listening, failing is another way of learning. And I've been failing um, and learning uh, for a long time. And um, you just have to uh, be comfortable knowing that that's a good teacher. 